Uh, many, many believe that this response, this humanitarian response, has been massively delayed and is inadequate. Why has it taken so long for humanitarian aid to arrive to Sudan? Because so many of the humanitarian aid which we had in stock was looted. All the warehouses, WFP, UNHCR and others in Darfur were looted. Vehicles from the humanitarian agencies were looted. Uh, the offices of my own mission, UNITAMS, as well as of the agencies in most of the towns of Darfur were looted. Food trucks were looted. Uh, WFP lost like 4,000 metric tons of humanitarian goods. So if all this is looted, you cannot distribute it. Um, four of our humanitarian workers of UN staff in service distributing aid were killed. So after the killing of three of the WFP employees in North Star 4, WFP declared a suspension of its operations and there wasn't things being looted, there wasn't much to distribute. So what we need is to resume humanitarian activities is a ceasefire, a ceasefire that holds. Just to ask you about the ceasefire proposals that we've seen, have they held? Because all evidence from the ground has shown that fighting has continued during those ceasefire periods. None of the ceasefires has been respected in total. They have all been respected partially and sometimes only in some locations and not in others. But it's work in progress. You've sat at the negotiation table with both the head of the army and the head of the RSF many times. Do you see them coming together to negotiate again? Well, in the last two weeks there was, there was no table to negotiate. I mean, we, we called upon them, we, we spoke to them on the phone, uh, but there was no common discussion uh, between them. Before that, yes, when we still were speaking about a political process, they were all in the room, signatories, civilian, military, non-signatories in different formats. Now we have been speaking individually to them, and the idea of getting people together uh, in a neighboring country, which is supported by uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, uh, US, UK, but also by the EGAD countries, by South Sudan, for example, is to actually bring them physically together, and you need face-to-face -to, -face to agree on some of the modalities of a ceasefire, which is more than just a declaration that we are going to stop the fight. And the question that's often been raised is how could you let this happen? We supported where we could, we facilitated where we could, we facilitated discussions about critical sensitive issues like transitional, like transitional justice for example or even security sector reform but we have no executive mandate and even if some people, people like to say that the United Nations has uh, been steering the political process. Was it good or not? It's not true. It has been a Sudanese-led and Sudanese-owned process. But do you understand the anger and frustration that people feel towards this process? I understand the anger and frustration which people feel towards different actors. And of course some actors who probably run this political process against the wall find it easy to then accuse the foreigners, be that the United Nations or the African Union or EGAD, to, resp to be responsible for that. But we have, I mean, sometimes I have to explain it. We have not been sitting in the room when texts have been written. We are not a peacekeeping mission and we are not a mission with an executive mandate. All decisions in these countries are and have been Sudanese decisions. The resistance committees at the heart of the protest movement who really have a strong presence on ground obviously have a slogan, no partnership, no negotiation. What do you make of that? Is that sustainable? Well, the resistance committees had these slogans after the, after the coup. And they have, despite their political differences or the broad spectrum which they, which they are active in and partly represent, they have mostly remained commit, committed to that, but, but many of them have adapted it and said we are not negotiating with the military. But if political parties and political movements negotiate with the military and the result of that in a process facilitated by the trilateral mechanism, if the result of that is a return to civilian government, we will support that. 
We've now seen the UK working with the US, with the Sudanese military, with the Sudanese police to get people out, to evacuate them. It's just a real, really integrated approach. How important is that kind of approach in dealing with the issues in Sudan? And how can that be done without enabling any one party? It is, it is extremely important that, that all actors, and you're speaking about regional and international actors, cooperate here with one another in the first place, both in the messaging to the warring parties, as it were, but also in action like extracting people from conflict zones, evacuating them. And, and we have seen here that we have had a few great signs of, of solidarity, like uh, the French military flying out um, uh, United Nations uh, United Nations staff, but also INGO staff, staff from international non-governmental uh, organizations out of Darfur, in, out of a war zone, that is. Um, that's not every nation would be prepared to, so, uh, so we were very, very grateful to the French for that. Were you harmed at all during the Knesset? Personally, I was, I was never harmed. But staff members were. Staff members were held at gunpoint. Staff members were thrown out of their houses by armed fighters who took positions there. Houses were broken into. We had at least one case of attempted sexual assault on a, on a female staff member. And uh, many of the houses, apartments, were hit by stray shells and bullets. And you have to understand that for us in the United Nations and for many of the international non-governmental organizations and the embassies, Khartoum is a family duty station, which means we, we have been there with our families and kids, and therefore many, many of the staff wanted to bring their family into security, as many of our Sudanese friends and colleagues also do. Were you shocked by the sheer scale of the violence, by the brutality of it? Well, I think in any outbreak of war, you are shocked what humans are able to who otherwise, and we have been living with our Sudanese neighbors, um, are a very, very generous, friendly people. Sudanese have risked their life to bring foreigners out of the conflict zone because Sudanese know some of the ways we wouldn't know. They know where it's dangerous, where it's less dangerous. But they're still risking their life and have been risking their lives for us or for other foreigners to take them out of the conflict zones. And, and we're very, very grateful for, for the support of these Sudanese. In retrospect, is there anything you could have done to prevent this? I'm sure we could have done things differently, but I guess that's for a post-conflict lessons learned exercise, which definitely will come. For now, I think, we have to concentrate on getting a ceasefire and doing things differently, which is always possible, doesn't necessarily mean doing things better.